Hello ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we're going to continue on with our meteorology topic and this will be the last in the subject um, and we're going to cover catastrophic weather which is kind of usually the big whiz bang ooh wow kind of stuff um, that meteorology deals with. Storms with lightning and thunder are considered thunderstorms, oddly enough. Um, they also involve heavy precipitation, sometimes hail, and gusty surface winds. Some favorable conditions leading to thunderstorms include unstable atmospheric conditions, strong convection cells, um, this is called a convective storm, and also the presence of a buoyant force, which is the force on a less dense object immersed in a denser object. So basically it's bouncing around inside the clouds. The trigger for convection includes weather fronts, um, so if you have a fast uplift of warm air, unequal surface heating, surface convergence and divergence aloft, topographic barriers, and arrival of cold air aloft. One of the things that you'll see thunderstorms most often is you'll see them clustered around cities, and that's because there is uneven he heating around cities. You have um, they, they form heat islands and basically thunderstorms react to that and the high warm air that's way up high gets moved around by the cold air masses as they come in and it creates more thunderstorms. Ordinary or cell thunderstorms are also known as air mass thunderstorms or pop-up thunderstorms. Typically they form where surface converging winds have no significant change of either strength or direction with the height. So in other words, there's limited wind shearing around. What goes up comes back down in the same place. So this is a typical summer afternoon uh, thunderstorm that you hear about. Um, these usually last no more than an hour, extend no more than a kilometer, and rarely produce strong winds or large hail. Cell thunderstorms are so common, we're going to talk about how they develop. So the first one is called the cumulus or growth stage. Usually there's an updraft where there's warm and moist air gets uplifted, it expands and condenses, remember that adiabatic um, process that happens in the clouds, and forms towering clouds. Latent heat gets released, which means the temperature in the cloud is higher than outside uh, of the air. So the air keeps rising and the updrafts are strong so that the cloud droplets remain suspended in the cloud. There is usually no precipitation or lightning during the cumulus stage. The mature stage is when the precipitation starts. It involves entrainment, which is dry air from around the cloud is being drawn into the cloud, and some of the cloud droplets will evaporate and chill the air. It also includes a downdraft. The cold and heavy air begins to sink, and the updraft and the downdraft form a storm cell within themselves. Then you get a gust front with the boundary between the cold and the warm air at the surface, and you get lightning and thunder at this stage. Finally, you have the dissipating stage. The updraft begins to weaken, the gust fronts move away, the precipitation lightens up, and the downdrafts dominate. So basically you start cutting off the fuel supply for the storm. So it just starts to peter out and die. And this all happens, remember, cell thunderstorms usually take place in less than an hour. So this all happens in under an hour. Multi-cell thunderstorms um, are when you have uh, multiple cells. The downdraft from dissipating storms from a cell thunderstorm will fuel the formation of the next cell. So basically, it's almost like dominoes. You have one, it dies, it creates a new one. Severe thunderstorms are characterized by at least one of the following, either large hail, strong wind gusts, or tornadoes. The longer a storm lasts, the greater the chance it has for becoming a severe storm, and it often forms along a weather front. They typically form if strong vertical wind shear, um, which means large changes of the wind with height, is present. The warm air updraft is not suppressed by the downdraft and the precipitation, so it just kind of builds and builds and builds on itself. Supercell storms consist of single violently rotating updrafts. 
the, the favorable conditions that form supercells are when the speed and direction of the winds uh, change with height and it forms a rotating updraft. The updraft and downdraft also don't cro cross, which means that the storm lives on for hours, and it often produces large hail, damaging surface winds, and tornadoes, and you can see a tornado forming in this cell. One of the serious side effects of storms, and one of the ones that causes the most damage and the mo most deaths in the country, is not the lightning, it's not the winds, it's the flooding. Flash floods are floods which rise rapidly with little or no advanced warning. They, the conditions are ripe for flooding when the influx of water into an area is more than the amount of water that can be drained away from that region. So, for example, if you have a ground that is saturated from a prolonged rainy season or a very long supercell thunderstorm, um, if you have very strong precipitation over a short period of time, or you can have not so strong precipitation, but for an extended period of time. So storms that reoccur at the same location um, can create these conditions for flooding. Storms happening in, over and over and over again in the same place is called training. Also, stationary weather fronts can result in a series of thunderstorms over the same re region and can also result in flooding. Most thunderstorms occur in Florida because it has an unstable atmospheric condition, which warm and moist surface air that prevails throughout the year. And it has summertime air mass thunderstorms. I'm from Florida and I can tell you it has a thunderstorm pretty much every day at 3.30 in the afternoon um, during about nine months of the year. But the ground is very good at draining away this um, the water because it's sandy soil. So that means that there's not a lot of flooding that is associated with these thunderstorms. The most se severe thunderstorms occur in the Great Plains. The warm or unstable air is dry and shallow and the ice crystals don't have time to melt. And so that's why you get the m large amount of hail per year. Lightning is an electrical discharge. It's a giant spark. Raindrops, snow crystals, and hailstones collide inside the cloud, and during these collisions, they can exchange electrons and ions. The exact mechanism is not well understood, but the bottom line is that the larger particles become negatively charged, and the smaller particles become positively charged, so basically you're creating a big battery inside the cloud. The larger particles will settle down to the bottom of the cloud because they're heavier, and smaller particles are lifted up to the top by the strong updrafts. Ninety percent of the time, cloud to ground lightning is from the negative cloud to the positive ground, and only ten percent of the time it's reversed, where you have a positive ground and a negative cloud, or I mean positive uh, positive cloud and a negative ground. Sorry. There's also cloud to cloud lightning discharges. This happens between oppositely charged regions on different clouds. Cloud to atmosphere discharges are pretty self-explanatory, and there's also base to top, so you have discharge within the same cloud. So the negative charges at the bottom of the cloud repel the electrons on the ground beneath the cloud. The ground just below the cloud is then positively charged, and if you take a look, you can see um, the positive charge on the crane that is sitting here by the SunTrust building in downtown Orlando. The ground away from the cloud will be negatively charged with excess electrons, which came from that crane. They used to be in the crane, and then they got transferred. Once the accumulated charges become large enough, some of the electrons will jump to the ground, and a current starts to flow. The molecules in the atmosphere below the cloud are bombarded with flying electrons, and they become excited and then emit light, and we see that as a spark or lightning. Okay, let's talk about some different kinds of lightning because this is really, really exciting. Forked lightning is when the dart leader deviates from the original path of the stepped leader. So you can see that here. Ribbon lightning is when you have a strong wind that shifts the ionized channel between successive return strokes. 
Bead lightning is when the ionized channel breaks up. Ball lightning is a floating luminous sphere, and that has been reported to go through walls, uh, form inside houses, all sorts of fun stuff. Sheet lightning is when there's a flash inside or obscured by the clouds. So basically, the whole sky lights up for just a second. Dry lightning is when they have lightning, but there's no precipitation. And heat lightning is distant lightning, which is not heard. Because it happens very, very far away, the short wavelength light is scattered and it appears orange. So it kind of looks like the setting sun. And that's why we call it heat lightning. There's other lightning phenomenon. This is St. Elmo's fire. And it's a corona discharge at the top of antennas or ship masts. And it was first known in ship masts from sailors. Fulgurites are fused sand particles that are a result of strong heating at the location of a lightning strike. So basically, you find them when the light hits, the lightning hits the ground, especially in beaches. You find these glass rods that are created by the lightning, and it, it retains the shape of the lightning, which is really cool. There's also cloud to upmos, upper atmosphere lightning, including elves, red sprites, and blue jets. And some of them look like this. We didn't even know that these existed until we had people sitting on the International Space Station for quite a while taking pictures of the atmosphere. And they started to notice the lightning going up above the atmosphere, which is kind of really cool. We see the light emitted from the air molecules as they become excited from the electrical discharge. The thunder is the sound that accompanies the lightning, and it results from the fast expansion of the gases that is heated to high temperatures from the electrical discharge. Sound propagates much slower than light. because The velocity of sound is only 330 meters per second in air, and the velocity of light in a vacuum is 300 million meters per second, so it's considerably slower. That's why we hear thunder long after the lightning. So if you want to determine how far away the lightning was, you count the seconds between the flash and the thunder, and then divide the number of seconds by five, and that will give you how many miles away it was. So if you don't hear any thunder, sometimes the sound wave is just reflected or absorbed while traveling through the air, and it may not reach us. And the thunder is basically a sonic boom, which is just like you would have when you have a jet breaking the sound barrier. Okay, so let's move on to tornadoes. Tornadoes are rapidly rotating columns of air around, uh, around a center that touches the ground. The rotation is typically cyclonic, which means it's counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. In the average, uh, it, uh, on average in the U.S., there are about a thousand tornadoes per year. There's also about a hundred tor tornado casualties per year. Most of the tornadoes occur in Tornado Alley that runs through the central plains. Tornado season is considered March to July and is spring in the south and summer in the north. The conditions for tornadoes that make it um, ripe for it is an unstable atmosphere which includes warm humid air below and a cool dry air above and also a strong wind shear. The most likely time of the day for tornado is the late afternoon because that's when the atmosphere is most unstable. Typical diameter for tornadoes is 1 to 600 meters, but in extreme places it can be over 4 kilometers wide. The typical wind speeds in tornadoes is between 40 to 300 miles an hour, and the typical duration is a few min minutes, but some have been known to last for several hours. The number of tornadoes within a 25-year period is shown on this uh, figure here. You can see that there's a total per state on the upper number. So, for example, if you're looking at Idaho, it says 33. The lower figure is the annual rate per state per 10,000 square miles. So that means that Idaho has an average for every 10,000 square miles of 0.16 tornadoes. You can see that's quite a bit different from Oklahoma, for example, with 7.9 tornadoes on average for every 10,000. The Fujita scale is the scale by which we measure how 
bad a tornado is. Um, and it is an exponential scale just like the Richter scale is. So that means that when you go from a 1 to a 2, it's 10 times as worse. So you can see on the Fujita scale, um, it goes from 0 to 5. And 5, like, like the notation says, the scale does continue up to a theoretical F12, but we have never seen one of those. Um, we very rarely have anything that gets above 318 miles an hour, so pretty much F5 is the top of the scale. And you can see also that the Fujita is, is based on how much damage it is. It's not just the miles an hour, it's how much damage you're going to see. Okie dokie. On to hurricanes. Hurricanes are tropical cyclones that have sustained winds of over 74 miles an hour. That's the minimum level that is considered a hurricane. Before, below that, it's considered a tropical storm. These form over the tropical regions of the oceans, and they form around centers of very low surface air pressure. The surface winds in the northern hemisphere are counterclockwise, and the southern hemisphere are clockwise, again because of that Coriolis effect. The winds are spiraling and intensifying toward the center. The typical diameter of a hurricane is 500 kilometers. Centers of the storm, which is called the hurricane eye, uh, can, which can be about 40 kilometers wide, is cloud-free and has very weak winds. And that's sometimes where the, the big damage happens, is that people think it's over, they walk outside, and then the rest of the hurricane slams into you. The eye is surrounded by a ring, which is called the eye wall, and it has intense winds and storm, and the clouds are lined into spiral rain bands after that. Hurricanes are also called typhoons in northeastern Asia, cyclones in India, and tropical cy cyclones in Australia. So it's the same thing, just different names. Tropical cyclone, however, is the common international name for a storm which developed in the tropics that have hurricane-like characteristics. The direction of movement of hurricanes is determined by the prevailing winds. In the tropics, they move to the west-northwest. The direction depends on the pressure and the wind system in the rest of the atmosphere in that location. Over the oceans, they follow closely the flow around the subtropical highs, because again, remember that the currents are moved by wind, and so are hurricanes, so they tend to follow the same basic pattern. The strength of a hurricane depends very much on the temperature of the ocean water at the time of formation. So if you have a hurricane that moves over a cooler spot in the ocean, it will die down. Sometimes it will go down to a tropical storm or even a tropical depression. By the way, this is the hurricane season from 2005. This is the Katrina year, and you can see that um, New Orleans got slammed more than once. It wasn't just Katrina that got her. The surface winds are cyclonic, which means counterclockwise, again in the northern hemisphere, and toward the low pressure center. In the, surf, in the center, the converging air is swirling and moving upwards, and the rising air will condense, form clouds, and release that latent heat that heats the core of the storm. The warm central core is a column of warmer air that is taller than the surrounding air and corresponds to a center of high pressure up above it. So this is why you have a hurricane eye, because you've got that warm air that got pushed into the center. It's rising up very rapidly, and it's kind of pushing out the storm and, and kind of basically putting a top on it and forcing it outwards. The resulting winds up above it are therefore anticyclonic outward of the high pressure cent center. So basically you've got it rotating in one direction one in at the bottom and another direction at the top and you get some pretty nasty weather as a result. You can see the difference between a hurricane, a tropical disturbance, depression, and storm here. You can see that the hurricane is very tightly coiled and it has a very distinct structure with that center um, eye where the high pressure is. And then you have uh, the storm, uh, the eye wall, and then you've got the storm bands. The tropical storm up above that you can see off the coast of Baja, you can see is um, starting to form those bands, but it hasn't generated a center yet. 
and tropical depressions and disturbances, they're really unorganized and they're not really, they dump a lot of rain, but they don't dump a lot of wind. Storm surges, again, just like the flash floods from thunderstorms, storm surges are what kills the most people. It's not the winds. It's not that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. But you have the storm surges and the flooding, that's what kills the most people as a result of hurricanes. And ironically enough, that's where they also put all the reporters during a hurricane is they stick them right on the beach, right in front of the storm surge. So it's extra exciting TV, I guess. Anyway, the storm surge can result from either the heavy rainfall, elevated sea level due to the low pressure center, the large ocean waves generated by the winds, in other words, high surf, or strong winds pushing the ocean water toward the beach. That process is called Ekman transport. Just like the Fujita scale for tornadoes, there is a scale for hurricanes. It's called the Saphir Simpson scale. Nobody ever calls it that, but that's what it's called. Um, so when they say a category one or category four hurricane, they're referring to the Saphir Simpson scale. It's set up similar to the Fujita scale. So again, it's a logarithmic scale, so it's or exponential scale, so it's multiples of 10. It's based also, uh, similarly to the Fujita, on the potential damage caused by pat particular hurricane conditions, but it is also pr based primarily on wind speed. During World War II, the practice of naming hurricanes became widespread in weather map discussions among forecasters, especially Air Force and Navy meteorologists who plotted the movements of storms over the wide expanses of the Pacific Ocean. It was kind of important since we were fighting there. The practice of naming hurricanes solely after women came to an end in 1978 when men's and women's names were included in the Eastern North Pacific Storm Lists. In 1979, male and female names were included in the list for the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. So, yay, we're equal again. Whenever a hurricane has had a major impact, however, any country affected by the storm can request that the name of the hurricane be retired by agreement of the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO. Retiring a name actually means that it cannot be used for at least 10 years. It's not retired historically forever or it doesn't have to be. This facilitates historic references, legal actions, and insurance claim activities. If that happens, a like gender name is selected in English, Spanish, or French for Atlantic storms. So, for example, Andrew hit Miami in 1992. It was a Category 4 hurricane when it landed in Miami. Andrew got retired. We haven't had another name for Andrew, but you'll notice that the next season there was another A name that was also male. And we haven't reused Andrew since. Katrina also got retired in 2005. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the lecture on severe or catastrophic weather. Hope you enjoyed it. It was kind of exciting. Uh, I especially like the lightning part. You guys have a great day.